Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, I guess, technically. Sorry for the uh, slight delay with these rooms that we're using. Um, there's not the same 10 minute rule as with regular classrooms, so we apologize for the delay. Um, we have two very exciting speakers today. I'm going to invite Shelby up to do our introductions. Uh, one quick thing we're going to, as in the past, just keep going um, in between the two. So we're going to have our first speaker take some questions, introduce and have our second speaker take some questions, and then wrap up and thank our speakers. And that way we can keep recording. And Amanda is uh, going to interact with our online audience. And so she'll be posing questions from them uh, at the appropriate times. So with that, I'll invite Shelby up. Good afternoon, everybody, and happy Halloween. Um, I want to welcome everyone to today's transdisciplinary seminar, um, and thank you for all, all for attending, as well as for everyone um, tuning into our live stream, um, to everyone in the ESRC who organized today's events, and of course to our two speakers for agreeing to be here. Um, so my name is Shelby McFadden. I am one of the master's students in the uh, Sustainability Science and Society program. And I have the pleasure today of introducing our two speakers. Um, so with that being, our, being said, our first guest speaker is Dr. Gary Pickering. Um, he received his Bachelor's of Science in Zoology from Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand. His postgraduate diploma in Viticulture and Enology with distinction from Lincoln University. Uh, has a certificate in Advanced Flavor Science from the University of Otago. And finally, his PhD in Wine Science from Lincoln University. Um, here at Brock, he is a professor of biological sciences and psychology, uh, research scientist at the Cool Climate Enology and Viticulture Institute. Um, as well, we are very um, lucky to have him as a member of the ESRC here at Brock. Um, he's also an adjunct professor at Charles Sturt University and the University of the Sunshine Coast in Australia. In terms of his research in sustainability science, he's focused on understanding the psychological barriers that prevent um, individuals from taking pro-environmental behaviors and actions, um, especially around climate change mitigation and adaptation. Um, so with that being said, today he will be talking to us um, about the barriers to climate mitigation at the individual level, um, speaking to the question of why we hesitate to um, take action despite all of the evidence of the impacts of climate change, um, specifically looking at the Canadian context um, and showing us some empirical results from studies that his lab is working on. So with that, can we all give a warm welcome and round of applause to Dr. Gary Pickering. Well, thank you, Shelby, for that wonderful uh, introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all today. Particularly pleasant to see some of my Covey colleagues here for this talk. Uh, they normally get to see just one side of my research program. It's all, all, that, all that wine chemistry stuff, but uh, I do have this other side, so thank you very much uh, for coming. If I heard you correctly, Ryan, this is being live streamed. I need to behave myself. <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> I thought you would learn from last time. So as Shelby's indicated, uh, what I want to do today is bring together uh, some recent empirical studies from our lab uh, that are all focused and keyed around one question, and one fairly simple question. That is, given the overwhelming scientific evidence of climate change and its impact for humanity, why as individuals are we not fully engaged, or many of us fully engaged, in both mitigation and adaptation behaviour? A really simple question. I tend to place these questions within the psychological um, paradigms, but as many of you will know, it's very grey, and of course very many different disciplines inform and speak to these, uh, to these questions. I've also chosen to highlight studies which um, uh, feature SAS students, typically folks doing their MRP or thesis research, uh, to give you an idea of how your stuff, I think, is important and fits into uh, larger bodies of, of research work. I'll need someone to throw something at me at the three-quarter mark, because I haven't timed this talk, so please feel free to throw things, preferably after about 30 minutes as a prompt to, uh, to, to push on. 
So in terms of introduction, uh, the big picture stuff, this will be uh, known, I think, and or hope to most of you, that IPCC has consistently said that the human response to these overwhelming uh, climate change impacts is wholly inadequate, possibly the understatement of, um, uh, of the millennia. We ain't doing very good ourselves as Canadians by most international metrics. So we can look at the Climate Change Performance Index, which has some um, reasonably well-validated measures of how a country is doing in terms of its um, emissions and also mitigation record. Good old Canada ranks at 51 out of 60 countries. The higher, the better. It's even led some uh, commentators to make these sorts of, of statements, that Canada still shows no intention of moving forward with climate policy and therefore remains the worst performer of all industrialised countries. Not something to be proud of. For me, that puts extra emphasis on us as Canadians to do our bit. And part of that, I think, means understanding what are the barriers that we erect that stop us from doing our bit. Again, I tend to position these barriers within uh, psychological paradigms, but I acknowledge again that they cross, they cross disciplines. And I'm a particular fan of um, uh, Phil Gifford from BC and the way he conceptualises the specific barriers that might be operational, and we'll talk more about those shortly. So really the two central questions for, uh, uh, for most of my work on the environment side are just this. What are the most salient psychological barriers to climate mitigation for Canadians. And then having, um, then gaining that information, what do we do with it? How do we use that to optimize communications, and to, and including environmental, environmental education, to try and um, change that behavior? I'm going to focus today almost solely on that first question, but most of the studies that I'll show you, in fact, have two parts. The first part, understanding the barrier for behaviour X, and then the second part being some empirical research to look at how do we optimise particular messages. But in terms of time, we'll just focus on the, on the barrier bit uh, today. This is a, a slight adaptation of uh, one of the um, frameworks that Gifford uses for understanding these barriers, and I think a lot of this came up in your required reading, which you've all read, thoroughly, understood, loved and want more. Yeah? <laughs> Wonderful. So this won't be uh, new information to you. And again, there's some grey area in terms of how one organises or conceptualises these, uh, these ideas, but I think um, the understanding is, is there. So limited cognition, and I place climate change scepticism and uncertainty within uh, that rubric. <coughs> if you don't think the thing's happening, you ain't got any motivation for doing something about it in terms of your own lifestyle choices. I've highlighted and read those particular barriers that we have tended to focus on historically in, in our group. They may or may not be the most important. Ideologies, worldviews, which incorporates um, political ideology uh, and also religion, techno-salvation, you know, particularly um, getting particular coverage in much of the Western media at the moment. It's a great way to um, dilute our own responsibility as individuals. Well, well, leave it to science. They'll work something out eventually, don't they, won't they? Uh, be it the various carbon sequestering technologies or be it the other um, approaches. Leave it to science. And that, by that way, we can rationalise our own relative inactions. Other people, so social comparisons or, and, and normative behaviours are, are an uh, aspect we'll come back to with some of the examples from our lab, as is the commons dilemma. Simple practical things like investments, sunk costs. Well, I've just spent $50,000 buying X, I don't know, cheap BMW. Would that buy you a BMW? Probably not my cheap BMW, why on earth would I now go and invest more in a hybrid or electric car? So a very practical example of a sunk, sunk cost. Mistrust and reactants, I think are very important. So mistrust either in the messenger, those who communicate 
science and climate change to us uh, and or mistrust in the message itself. I think reactants is particularly um, important and strong in some sectors of, Canadian, of North American society. And that's simply a, almost a hardwired reactance against advice or policy that infringes upon our perceived freedoms. So very, I think very um, salient for um, the Republican stereotype in the US. I think we often downplay the importance of, uh, of perceived risk, not just risk of what the impacts of climate change may mean in terms of my um, environment and, and those values that I hold, but practical stuff like functional risk. Electric cars, don't know, those batteries blow up, don't they? Well, psychological risk, being the only bloke on the, blo on the block that's taking his green bins out for organic waste disposal every week. Now, there is psychological risk in terms of uh, peer pressure and um, chastising socially by being that person. And limited behaviour, and I think we're all um, at various times guilty of, of, of the rebound effect. You know, that, the classic example, in fact, there's some data to suggest this, I've just bought my new green, environmentally friendly, fuel efficient car. Look at me. But I go and drive twice as far in this thing. Okay, it's a rebound effect or, it's a, or a tokenism. So, to what extent might these be salient for us as individuals and are there general characteristics of Canadians or subgroups within the Canadian population um, that we can identify and then look at optimising, uh, trying to change that behaviour? So five short studies, actually five long studies that I'll try and summarise shortly. Um, the first one was going after one of those very first barriers that, that Gifford had articulated, and that is scepticism and uncertainty. And I was curious to, um, uh, so this is, this is a reference for you in terms of um, uh, where this information's appeared in the peer-reviewed literature. You should be challenging all speakers that are up here and always challenge speakers and stuff that you read for source. Okay? You are graduate students in a, in a science, a social science program. Always demand and ask for peer-reviewed sources. If not, you should begin to be more sceptical, including a couple of, of our studies that are not yet published. So essentially we were interested in determining both the extent of climate change scepticism in the Canadian population, we know what it is south of the border, we pride ourselves as Canadians as not being largely like them down south, but is that the case in terms of climate change scepticism? And then look at how that might vary with uh, attitudinal um, uh, systems, beliefs, values, demographics, and so on. This is some nuance uh, when we look at climate change, Canadian climate change scepticism. So we launched a large survey, fairly poor response rate, we won't talk about that. And we measured stuff, and the stuff was uh, traditional social demographic variables uh, and previous measures of climate change scepticism and environmental attitudes. Uh, I realise I'm fast forwarding through the detail, but you have the reference if you uh, need to follow up. So we now get a whole bunch of statements, potential factors that could be influent, that could be important to the thing that you're measuring. The thing that we want to measure here is scepticism then it's appropriate to use some multivariate or reduction, data reduction techniques to try and pull out what's really happening. So we throw all these various statements, the typically like it statements where individuals um, uh, tell us the extent to which they agree or disagree with various statements about the environment, for instance. In this case, we throw it into a factor analysis and we get three um, uh, groupings of factors. So factor one here, if you look at, at some of these statements, claims that human activities are changing the climate are exaggerated. Climate change is just a natural fluctuation. It's too early to say whether or not climate change is a real problem. These things grouped together, ones in ye yellow, really nicely. They in fact became our climate change scepticism index. High agreement between these factors and they make intuitive sense. So, a bunch of statements here for which we can take the average value and that becomes our measure of climate change scepticism. 
You won't spend any time on this following two factors, but they also fell out nicely in terms of underlying dimensions. So, for instance, factor two is largely about the disinterest and need for more information on climate change. And factor three was very interesting. These statements all group around um, this idea of the emotional and moral dimensions of, uh, of climate change risk perception. So some interesting ways in which uh, it looks like this sample is thinking about climate change. Anyway, we have our index, our validated index for measuring climate change skepticism. We can then throw that into uh, various models to look at how these factors that we hypothesize would be important, your age, your gender, your high school education, um, your science proficiency, environmental values, in this case measured by a thing called NEP. How might these predict or be influential in scepticism scores? You do all that and do the math, which I'm sure you'll be extremely competent with by the time you've finished um, the methods course. And you need to be competent at this sort of stuff because you and your future careers will be thrown results. You'll be thrown data and expected to interpret and understand. So don't be scared about these sorts of outputs. Um, embrace the challenge because there's cool stuff and messages lurking behind it. Boil that down to a very sobering and simple graph. This is the main finding here, heavily simplified. All those measures of demographics, of knowledge, of ideologies uh, can be dumped into one of these three categories. This is social economic status, education and knowledge, including climate change knowledge, and various values and politics. Oops. When you look at how much, how much they influence scepticism scores, the biggest thing there is what? That, that values and politics bar is massive. The other two don't really matter. Environmental values and political affiliation, by a massive margin, explain most of the, or account for most of the scepticism around climate change in Canadians. Sorry, guys. We're very much like our cousins across the border. They are also two of the highest predictive factors. Some other stuff that comes out from this simplified um, first look is that our average scepticism score is somewhat lower than uh, a very similar survey conducted in the UK, although that survey was done several years earlier. Perhaps also sober, sobering is that despite being less sceptical than the Brits, approximately one in, third, one in three Canadians agrees with the statement, climate change is just a natural fluctuation in Earth's temperatures, despite the overwhelming scientific consensus that that simply ain't the case. And some uh, interesting asides that speak to the communications part of this, this study is that the um, most, uh, the, the statement with the highest degree amongst this cohort was that the media is alarmist about climate change. Okay, that was the most, most agreed to statement in this whole study. So that, that starts to suggest ways in which we might wish to communicate about climate change origins and impacts uh, going forward as, uh, as educators. Just quickly, we also had a look at the, the highly sceptical. So we took those, those portion of respondents that, that scored highest on the uh, scepticism index and just plotted um, the factor, factors that look to be influential. So everything on this side of, the, of this graph um, means that, that these individuals were much more likely to be highly sceptical uh, and the reverse relationship on this side of the graph. So anyway, the message is pretty clear. Of all the stuff you look at in terms of the highly sceptical, Voting Conservative, the Conservative Party, is by far and away uh, more likely to, lend, lend you, to land you in this, in this uh, sceptical group. Also living in Western, Austra Western Australia, Western Canada, which is an interesting finding, and some other bits and pieces there. Being male, and this comes up time and time again, guys, sorry. Right, so some preliminary evidence of that uncertainty in climate, and uncertainty and scepticism around climate change is operational for a significant portion of the Canadian adult population. And we can then speculate as to what sort of barrier uh, that might mean to individual actions. In the second part of the same study, we 
were curious about the relative importance of some of these specific barriers that uh, Gifford had identified. So in particular, we focused on uh, a, the se a sense of powerlessness in individuals, the commons dilemma, and perceived risk, and to investigate how they may be uh, important or not uh, to Canadians. So a couple of dependent variables, uh, the answer to two questions in fact. Have you changed your actions, at least in part, due to consideration of climate change, yes or no? And if, if yes, what were the predictors for that? And secondly, how influential have the following factors been in shaping your, your own behaviour around climate change? So two slightly different uh, but important uh, differences. So these two main um, measures that we went after, I think, deserve to be defined. Powerlessness, the contribution from changing one's behaviour cannot influence either the occurrence or the extent of climate change. Powerlessness. That's been linked with several um, other factors in the literature. Um, Commons dilemma, when individuals in a group are better off if they all cooperate and yet all have incentives not to cooperate. So we know from the literature that this is stronger when the contributions take place over a large time frame. We know that when contributions um, are anonymous, the cooperation within the group is lower. And we know that defection from these behaviours is, is higher in larger groups. You couldn't design a better wicked example or wicked problem than climate change when it comes to things we already know about climate, about the commons dilemma before we even jump in and look at climate change. So reasonable expectation that the commons dilemma would be operational for uh, and important for the Canadian uh, cohort. But these are some examples of, the, of a specific questions that individuals were asked um, using a Likert scale and then those responses are collapsed after we check for internal validity uh, to give us a, an average score across these dimensions. And uh, some other variables we also looked at and how these were defined. So let's get to the results. So to the question, um, have, you have you changed your actions, at least in part, due to climate change? These are standardised coefficients running various, uh, various models. Things that appear above the line are positively associated, the horizontal line, positively associated with, pre with predicting whether or not someone says they've taken action and things below the line uh, are negatively associated. So straight away we can see the higher the perceived risk, the more likely the individual, this is the perceived risk of the impacts of climate change the more likely the individual is to report having taken action. One really interesting finding, it comes up in the next slide too, um, and it's significant, it's looking foolish, unless we haven't seen before in the literature. So it seems that Canadians are particularly sensitive to the possibility of looking foolish if they engage in certain climate change mitigation um, activities. Similar result when we look at that second question, which is how influential specific factors have been in shaping decisions about actions that might change climate, that might affect climate change. And most importantly, we should look at what's statistical and what's not. So when we um, throw it into the machine, we get these, uh, these findings. The machine here is just a simple t-test, which I know you all know how to do. So we can see that. Again, perceived risk is the single most important salient predictor uh, of climate change action for these individuals. How well informed they, they believe they are in terms of specific behaviours that can make a difference. <coughs> Low powerlessness, as you might expect, uh, predicts inaction. Again, looking foolish comes up. And gender is significant. Yet again, being a male is a significant predictor or not. Um, being for climate change, not uh, actions, not uh, influencing your behaviour, climate change um, uh, considerations. There's some really interesting, I think, actionable stuff for educators and policymakers here around climate change mitigation, but uh, we'll need to leave that for maybe another invitation um, later in the semester. The next couple of studies are going to um, 
ground these somewhat nebulous ideas about what do you do about climate change or what actions have you taken with concrete examples that people, I think, can attach to uh, and relate to perhaps a little bit better than these uh, uh, more academic questions that we've asked up, and, up until now. Now, one or two, so here's um, a study that uh, from, from Wins and uh, uh, Kimberly Nicholas uh, published very late 2017. But I think it's wonderful on a bunch of fronts. One reason why, it, using uh, peer-reviewed literature on G8 green, greenhouse gas emissions, these authors were able to give us this wonderful infographic in which average across several industrial nations, the relative efficacy of specific lifestyle choices that we can make is um, projected onto how much greenhouse gas emissions that would result in. So we've got numbers, real numbers. So we can see, for instance, that the single most important thing we can do as individuals to mitigate climate change is have one fewer child. The effects of having children, of course, are uh, propagated across, across our ongoing generations. Look, it's 50 times more important, more impactful than the next, well, roughly 50, maybe 25, I don't do math well, but the next, next most important uh, factor, which is uh, living car free. So we're gonna, we finished, we did our work before this nice graphic came out. So we've focused in the next few slides on a couple of these um, uh, individual level behaviours. We've focused on an aspect of waste disposal, recycling, which fits within the moderate impact in terms of behaviour. And we've looked at um, meat eating and what might the um, motivators and barriers be. So both those, those behaviours fit within the moderate to high impact um, choices that we make. So this next study, this is where you can go to get all the juicy details. Um, Sam Steer uh, was a, um, a graduate from second cohort, first, from the first SASC. So you can survive the program, and you do graduate, you do do good things, and Sam is proof of that. She uh, was the principal author in this, um, this nice little paper that was uh, published last year, I believe. And what she was interested in was... Um, I'm going to pick and choose some, uh, uh, some of the data here. Um, she was most interested in what the, um, the patterns and motivation, motivators for red meat consumption in Canada were. Pretty simple question, why do we eat meat? It's a simple question, try and find an answer to that in the literature. The meat industry almost certainly knows why. But in terms of publicly accessible literature, there ain't much, there was nothing in Canada, there was not much else out there in general. That to me is a good starting point for looking at how, do we, how might we then um, encourage um, better behaviour, which might be movement, moving towards meat alternatives, which might be to uh, directly encourage reduction in, in red meat uh, consumption. Uh, we focus mainly on looking at different framing strategies for communicating the impacts of red meat consumption, but that won't form uh, a part of this talk. And we like our meat. We're in the top 10 meat uh, consuming nations per capita in the world. And I like the target on red meat consumption because it's something that can change. It's a habitual behaviour that's, I think, really important in terms of, ch um, of meaningful change. It's a behaviour that most of us have a high degree of control over. And it's actually an anthropogenic uh, contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. So the extent to which guilt and buggering up our planet may motivate us, then red meat consumption could be a good target behaviour for, for that. So very briefly, the method um, was a represent, representative sampling of Canadian red meat eaters, uh, contracted out to a third-party marketing company in terms of accessing those individuals. Um, normal demographic measure, measures, measures of environmental values, um, and a lot of information about their actual red meat consumption behaviour. This was intended to provide baseline data for follow-up work over the next several years. Uh, some different message manipulations, which um, I won't uh, be going into. So just some simple graphs, which um, I just wanted to 
more highlight this as an area for, um, for further work. When you ask people who eat red meat about the main motivational factors that influence that behaviour, this is what you get. Uh, and organised here from um, uh, decreasing saliency or importance. So taste, quality and cost are the three most important motivators for red meat, eat red meat eaters. Perhaps not surprisingly, the potential ethics and morality around red meat consumption do not feature as, uh, as highly salient for this cohort. One really interesting result, at least for me, it may not be for you, perceived positive health consequences. It's actually quite a high mot motivator for red meat eaters. One reason for that, it comes from some work uh, from the group of Piazza et al. And they conceptualize red meat eating in terms of a framework called the four ends. We won't uh, need to go into it, but one of the ends speaks to um, seeing the relative health importance of um, the positive health importance, uh, uh, health consequences of red meat as being part of the necessary dimension whereby meat consumption is rationalised by the belief that it's necessary for strength and health. So it looks to be some really clever rationalisation that is, is happening here. Because um, that's a high motivator. And pick up any uh, half decent uh, researched you know, news article about red meat and health and you ain't going to find the overwhelming evidence supporting these, uh, this, this belief about it being positive, about it being healthy. At least not at the levels that, um, that Canadians consume red meat, which is part of this survey. Um, we also um, uh, acquired some baseline information about what the level of awareness was amongst red meat eaters about the environmental impacts of red meat production. This is farmed red meat production. What are the environmental impacts? This is percentage of respondents. Again, remember, it's a fairly he healthy end of about 600. And these are specific um, environmental impacts documented by, uh, by other commentators. We don't know much, do we? I mean, about a third of us know that, yep, cows can contaminate water. And that's as good as it gets. I was really quite shocked by, by this, again, given the evidence in the scientific literature about the environmental impacts of red meat production. What I won't show you is what happens after we provide educational messaging. <laughs> it's a good news story, these bars go up, but the baseline uh, for red meat eaters in Canada to me is, I would call this shocking in terms of the actual reported knowledge about the impacts of that behaviour. So it's a starting point to the extent that we think the knowledge deficit model is true and that just educate people and they'll do the right thing, which of course that's not the case. Um, and we ran some logistic regressions to find, um, again, I haven't shown you the data, but um, those individuals that were most responsive to being educated about the environmental impact, impacts of red meat, uh, um, tended to be those individuals that had existing high-ish environmental, pro-environmental scores. Those that are born outside of Canada were most responsive to to changing their um, consumption. Those that live in the prairies, that's probably a, fu a, a function of uh, there's more room for them to move because they do in fact eat a lot more uh, red meat. Uh, and education, having an environment or science related education greater than high school level meant that meat eaters were more responsive to educational messaging about the environmental impacts of, uh, uh, of their behaviour. Um, second last study, how am I going for time? Not good? Quarter to one. Oh, plenty of time. Three o'clock? Three thirty. Awesome. Um, I just wanted to highlight once, and it's only because Jessica's in the room. Um, I wanted to highlight one aspect of a study that we've just finished and it's in review process now. Um, again, one of our, our graduates, um, uh, Gala, uh, MRP student, has, uh, has helped with this wonderful, uh, wonderful paper looking at um, mainly the role of trust, trust in messenger and trust in message as a way to optimise communications uh, and news articles around climate change impacts. 
But one thing we pulled out, uh, I have to go a little bit more quickly. What, what, I wanted to bring it up here because one of the measures, dependent measures, was activism support. I know Jessica's um, done some work along with others that, uh, uh, that you're, you're doing and planning to do. Um, and so one of the things we looked at uh, in a combined Canadian and um, Australian sample, and I've thrown all responses together here because the results did not vary with, with country, was to look at um, those factors that predict either passive or active um, involvement in, in environmental groups, which I've called environmental activism here. And because it's a large M, so you can get, get a sense of, where, of what might be true when you get these large numbers. The other objectives are not important for this talk. Um, and why the interest in supporting pro-environmental groups, well, again, it's another individual level action or decision that we can make that can make a difference in terms of climate mitigation. Um, I'll, fast, I'll, I'll miss that. So this is an awful graph, not really optimised. It's not even a graph. It's an awful table, not really <coughs> optimised for this talk. But what I wanted to highlight was you can, you can measure a whole bunch of things in terms of people's characteristics and then use, in this case, an odds ratio. It's just another, another way of modelling and accounting for co-variables to work out, in this case, what might be the factors. Phones off, please. It's not very professional. It's on the camera, they think I'm looking at you. <laughs> what might be the most salient factors that predict one's likelihood to be involved in a pro-environmental group? And so to me, odds ratio was the best way to look at that. I guess the reviewers will soon tell us whether or not that assumption is right or not. But of all the things we've thrown into the model, I've just pulled out here those that were statistically significant, those that were predictors. So left-leaning affiliation, you're two and a half times more likely to, to be a passive or active support, I'm sorry, an active supporter of environmental groups um, if you were left-leaning compared to those with other affiliations. Flood exposure um, uh, is interesting. Those with um, medium to high levels of flood exposure uh, were, were more likely to uh, indicate active support of environmental organisations. And active support it was defined in several ways, but it included a, a, a desire to, um, uh, to actually join the organisation. Um, and this comes up time and time again, directly and indirectly. The belief that climate change is due to human activity, time and time again, that predicts individual level action, in this case, active su support for pro-environmental um, organisations. A bunch of interesting interactions here with <coughs> one's environmental values, uh, but I don't have time to go, to go into those. Um, um, I think some of these measures maybe w w will help inform our, our group project that goes on to look at uh, this in, in more detail at a global level. Um, uh, this project here just finished up. It's the last one I want to talk about, study five. Uh, the paper is in review at the moment, in Environment and Behaviour. Um, and, ah, she's just left. It's a chance for fame. Hannah uh, was a, a, a key um, researcher uh, in, in this process and my two colleagues from the Niger region who are um, uh, in the waste, um, the waste program. So very, very briefly, uh, context, diversion of waste, including organic waste, uh, is recognised as an individual level behaviour, something we can do something about uh, that has environmental impacts. And one of those is, is, is uh, methane production, so a very potent greenhouse gas. One way we deal with that is through uh, residential organic waste diversion schemes. So in Niagara, we call it the Green Bin Program, where you throw all your food stuff and put it out on the um, roadside. And if raccoons don't get to it beforehand, someone comes and picks it up and disposes of it. It goes to an appropriate composting uh, facility. What we do know is that in the Niagara region, we have one of the lowest participation rates in, uh, in Ontario for this particular program. 
And so I partnered with the region to ask the question, why? <laughs> what are the, both the motivators for participation and non-participation in the program? And of course, that can inform what we can do better, either at a policy level at the region or in terms of uh, education and communication. Look, look, I get really excited. Large numbers, 2,621 Niagara residents completed the survey. So I was very excited about that because you can do lots of fun stuff with the stats, which you won't have time to display here. Simple graphic showing of those that currently participate, what are the most important factors for them? And so the, the, the light blue bar and the yellow bar are the most important. They're factors that individuals say, yep, they're moderately or, or very important to them to explain why they participate in the Green Bin program. So three of these four most important, so from left to right are most important to least important. Three out of the four most important factors identified by participants are environmental. They want to do the right thing by the environment. That's the prime motivator for current participants. Things like the fact that it's a bylaw, and you can get nasty fines from the region if you don't put out your organics or if you throw them in the garbage, doesn't matter for these individuals. Not an important factor. I told a lie. There's one stat here. So we threw all this into um, regression model, and these are standardized coefficients. So things above this line are significant contributors to participating in a green bin program. Those below the line um, mean they are negatively associated. What stands out? Well, a low knowledge of the benefits of the program stands out as being a, um, as being a predictor. Question, a role, for, a role for education? Or maybe it's simply the fact that those that are already engaged in the program are more sensitive to um, uh, uh, communications around the benefits. This again comes out, which uh, continues to amaze me, that is that um, uh, belief in anthropogenic climate change. Again, if you, uh, if you believe in the human origins of this, the more likely you are to participate in the program. Good old political party affiliation, the general interpretation, the more leftist you are, leftist, the more likely you are to participate. And a role for education, general education. What's missing from this? NEP score, environmental values, was not a predictor of the likelihood of you uh, participating or not participating. In fact, the scores were very, very similar. If we look as a last slide, second last slide, um, we pull out those people that, who do not participate currently in the Green Bin program and we ask them why. And then we code stuff. But <laughs> we's not me. Hate coding. You pay someone else to do the coding. And this is what, um, this is what comes out. Uh, I apologise, it's, it's, it's hard to see, but basically from, as you work from the top to the bottom, uh, these are the most to the least salient factors for non-participation in the program. I think a highlight, thing to highlight here uh, is um, how practical the concerns are and therefore how solvable they are. So issues like um, the malodour of sorting through the material, the concern about animals making a mess, these things are just engineering technology things that can be, that can be fixed, in my humble opinion. I think third or fourth from the top is the price of the liners, the, the, the bag that you put inside your thing. Now, that can be subsidised by the region or others, at least until habits are formed. And that gets key when it comes to environmental behaviour. So I'm quite upbeat about this. These are the practical things that can be done. Right, last slide-ish. To bring all that stuff together very succinctly, um, so climate change uncertainty and scepticism for us, the Canadian population, is strongly predicted by your political affiliation and your environmental value and less so but, uh, your location. The most salient barriers from this initial survey anyway for Canadians for engagement in climate mitigation behaviours are perceived risk, powerlessness, the degree to which you believe that humans are responsible, how well informed you are, looking foolish, being male. It's a shame that looking foolish and being male are sort of next to each other, isn't it? It's just how it came out. Canadians eat red meat. 
because of taste, quality, and cost primarily. Well, straight away you can see a potential intervention. Won't be popular, tax the crap out of it. If it's a behaviour that you want uh, as a society to change, then top-down approaches, including taxation, may be effective. Uh, and also, uh, red meat eaters have a low level of awareness of environmental impact, which might speak to a role of, uh, of education. So, um, in terms of uh, environmental activism support, we know several things can predict that. Political affiliation, previous exposure to floods, climate change belief, and various levels of interactions. And folks in Niagara who participate in organic waste diversion schemes do so mainly for environmental concern. And as I've highlighted, I think there's practical options to, to move or motivate those individuals that don't currently participate. Okay, so I'm not going to do this slide because I'll get told off, but there's a bunch, I think, of take-home messages which I haven't given you data to support that I take from the communications side of, of, uh, uh, of these studies. Um, two slides to finish, I just want to highlight some, some ongoing work uh, in our lab um, with uh, uh, MRP students looking at the role of trust, I've alluded to that. Um, Emily, who's a, um, a thesis student within the SATS program, is just finishing up a project with Ryan and myself looking at uh, climate change adaptation and beliefs within the wine industry. Um, Got a really cool project we just started with Shannon, who's a psych honours student, looking at cultured meat. Who's heard of cultured meat, lab-grown meat? Yeah, it's about no one outside of an environmental class but puts their hands up. This is a really cool alternative to farmed meat that we know nothing about, at least in Canada, in terms of what the attitudes and beliefs are around this product. Once we know that, we can look at um, optimising marketing and communication to try and shift behaviour. Um, a really cool study with um, a, co a colleague from University of Sunshine Coast and a, a Brock psychology student looking at that infographic I gave you before from Wins and uh, Nichols, looking at um, uh, as a population, do we know this stuff? Do we know the relative efficacy of different actions on, on greenhouse gas emissions? Because that will provide important baseline data for um, policy and we're um, about halfway through that. And a, a project I'm really excited about that Jessica is leading um, uh, shortly to look at uh, uh, some of these uh, questions around um, activism support and uh, transformations towards sustainability. This is, is the wonderful uh, lab or motley crew, or call them what you will, who do most of the work that I've been highlighting um, today. So, and thank you to those that uh, could make it. Uh, thank you to uh, various funding organisations and, uh, and my colleagues around the table, Ryan in particular, for, for their ongoing support. And if time allows, I'd be very happy to address any questions. Thank you. Wonderful. Somebody want to come and say thank you, and then we'll take one or two questions and move on. I just want to thank uh, Dr. Gary Pickering for doing that awesome talk for us today. Um, I One thing that just really strikes me, I think it's really important, important for a group like us, we're all, we all really care about sustainability and we all want to figure out, you know, um, what's the best thing to do in terms of policies and science and action, but I think a lot of times we don't necessarily think about that individual level and that shows that it's very complex and there's a lot of factors to take into consideration. Um, and that's that's something important that we do need to pay attention when, pay attention to, sorry, when doing these things. So. Um, yeah, so I guess thank you very much. Um, well, I guess we'll open the floor to questions. Yeah. Time for a couple questions and then we'll switch over to our next speaker. <laughs> Did you want to? Yeah, you can go ahead. You can pick. <laughs> who was first? It was a top. <laughs> I, I, I think it was you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
maybe. Uh, uh, are you, uh, and that's not a reflection of how you've asked the question. Um, are you asking how does the, um, the true fake news, not the Trump fake news, but the actual BS, uh, how, uh, to what extent that is influencing um, climate change um, de denial? I, uh, th I mean, the, the, there, are, there are several commentators that have, have looked at that. Um, uh, the Yale group in particular uh, have done a lot of work on uh, trying to get inside the head of, um, of US, uh, public, uh, US um, climate skeptics. I think we like, all of us like to surround ourselves in echo chambers, and I think that's particularly the case with um, conservative climate skeptics. You know, we surround ourselves, we feed ourselves, we um, allow us, ourselves access only to information that reinforces ideologies. And that's dangerous, and, but dangerous for us. We need to be cautious with that, but it's, it's dangerous in terms of reinforcing ideologies, because the one thing that you can almost never change is someone's ideology. And so by creating that echo, echo chamber, you can feed whatever rubbish you want into that. It gets um, cognitively, pro cognitively processed as simply more evidence to reinforce the underlying ideology, which might be, um, you know, freedom, less government, reactance, and, and we find ways to self-justify and rationalise um, uh, other stuff. So I'm not sure if I've even come close to answering your question, but that's... Um, yeah, the extent to which these false messages are influencing individuals or not, I don't know. There's information out there. My guess is they're not doing much for the more sceptical folks because they are sceptical because of ideology. Rational discourse and argument plays a zero role in that. And I think that realisation, um, you know, it's fully widespread now in terms of strategies. The strategies often are now targeting, it, targeting the, the unknowns or those on the fence or those that may be deniers due to, for non-ideological reasons. There's more chance one can move them and motivate them with rational thought, maybe. Good, good question, thank you. Jen. Um, I really Yeah, great, great question. Um, I've got a partial answer to that in the paper because that was a question we asked ourselves of the data. Of course, I can't remember what, remember what we said in the paper. Um, the initial hypothesis was that it was simply mir mirroring NEP scores, that there may have been differences in the cohort in terms of their existing environmental values, and that gets reflected in, in age. That wasn't the case. Age um, and environmental values were approximately the same in this sample. Might be practical stuff. You know, we're living in a region where there's lots of you folk, lots of students who are awfully, awfully busy and may also have less autonomy and control over, over the green bins than, um, than older individuals. Um, my guess is that it's more of a pragmatic artefact of those sorts of things rather than um, uh, uh, anything tied to, to, to uh, cognition or beliefs. But I'll check the paper and see if, uh, if I've got um, uh, even more clever thoughts on that um, in, in the document. Thank you. Ah, first. Yes, um, so, so certainly income, um, both family income and personal income were definitely one of the demographics that we measured and threw into various models. Um, I actually can't recall the, the graph I put up, but I don't think it was uh, a reliable predictor for, for anything, including interactions between income and other, other factors. Um, 
And in fact, even underlying things like in, in, in EP scores, there was some relationship or some of the other work that we've done. But not massive, you know, I think, uh, which speaks to some of the stereotypes we might have about different uh, uh, income groups. The environmental values were roughly the same. Yes? Yep, great questions. Um, the, the answer to your second question is with much difficulty. The answer to your first question, um, yes, as I alluded to, um, all by one of these studies had a second part, and the second part was focused around um, uh, educational communication. So in the case of the red meat consumption, there was a second study, if you will, that was about manipulating different aspects, different ways of presenting information about the environmental impacts of red meat uh, production. And then the sorts of behavioural intent questions at the end. You know. Knowing this, how much will you change your behaviour? It's actually much more sophisticated than that and, and validated. Um, we've tended to date to focus solely on framing and framing theory, and we've tended to focus on, um, on uh, social norms. So we often will introduce a social norm manipulation. Um, telling people that the, the target behaviour is something that more and more people in their, in their locality are actually engaged in, things like that, and then measure the effect that has. We've also played with uh, framing messages in terms of um, uh, geography, so local impacts, for instance, versus global impacts, to what extent might they motivate you to change your belief in, let's say, anthropogenic climate change or to move you towards more mitigation behaviours. And there are some others. So we've used framing theory largely to look at the so what, how do we change behaviour? We're using communication, but of course that's, that's as much a reflection on my lack of, um, let's say, policy uh, interest and, and expertise. Uh, uh, I think there's a lot to be done when it comes to messaging, communication and education. So that's my bias and that's why that's, they're the treatments that we look at in terms of trying to move, move behaviour in the right direction. Sir. Uh, for the 75 slide under methodology, you've written in some stuff. I have no interest in delving into that, but I just appreciate that you know what address it. My question is on uh, barriers, and specifically, a few of us have looked into the barriers of programming and behavior, and convenience and habit were two of the, the sessions that came to the forefront. I think you addressed convenience in, in bits and pieces, um, but I'm wondering what you've done in relation to habit environmentally, but not Yep, absolutely. So to your first uh, question, comment, or observation, you ha I'm happy to give you the paper to read so you can fill in the we did stuff bit, um, and you can tell me if the stuff we did was good stuff or not in terms of methodology. Habits are very important. That's a good uh, point that you've brought up. Um, Literature is, you know, we are creatures of habit. That truism is just that. It's a truism. Um, and it shows itself out in several of our studies. So, for instance, um, actually the last one you, you brought up, the um, recycling and organic waste. There's, pl there's plenty of evidence, and I guess the organic waste stuff now speaks to this, that when you're introducing a new behaviour, say at a regional level, you know, let's, let's wind it back 20 years, 15 years, and organic waste diversion, sounds great, doesn't it? Throw your shit in this bin, not that bin, was first being rolled out. There's evidence that if you can invest heavily at that stage in terms of everything from policy through to um, uh, messaging to get people to try that new behaviour, it sticks. It becomes habit forming and you've won. Trying all these manipulations down the track where attitudes towards the target behaviour have become entrenched is much, much more difficult to, 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 to move from. And that just speaks, that speaks partly uh, to habit. And very quickly, um, yes, habit's critical in all, all sorts of really impactful behaviours, which is why some of our most recent work is, forgive our old people, we're targeting 17, 18, 19 year olds. It's great trying to get ethics approval for this stuff, but we've done it. Why are we targeting young ones? Well, if you look at those th um, three most important environmental behaviours that you can do, 
have less children, have one less child, get rid of the meat, eat veggies. That's about talking to 17, 18 and 19 year olds, not talking to me or to others around the room. And particularly when it comes to food related behaviour, which is extremely habitual, the sooner you can get in and set um, food preferences, the more likely they will stay throughout the lifetime. And it is largely about habit formation. So that's a very good point and probably a great observation to, to finish up on. Thank you again. Yeah, so thank you for the awesome question. So I want to thank everybody for engaging. I think that was awesome. A lot of great questions. Um, also, again, to Dr. Gary Pickering for having a really interesting discussion, I thought. Sure. Yeah. Um, The second year while we get ready for a second guest. Maybe this way. There we go. As long as that's fine, you can just tilt pocket. If that's comfortable for you. Yep, sounds great. I'm also going to steal a keyboard. Whenever, yeah. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, 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 no, no worries. Just be careful with that cord. Good. Set it down here. Let's see. Oh, let's see. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so we're very fortunate to have a second speaker with us today. Um, if everyone can welcome Veronica Marchek. Um, she has her Bachelor's of Science as well as her Master's of Public Health, and she is currently a health promoter for the Niagara Region Public Health. Um, today she's going to be talking to us about understanding the role of public health within the phenomenon of climate change, uh, the risks that climate change poses to population health, um, how to tackle these challenges at the local level within Niagara, um, as well as how the Niagara Region Public Health is working on defining regional strategies to um, mitigate the impact of climate change and build um, resilient communities. So let's give a warm welcome Perfect. to Veronica. That was actually a pretty good summary, so thanks for, for that. Um, I'm very excited to have the opportunity to come in today. Um, a lot of the work that I'll be talking about today um, is quite new to the region, uh, as well as this portfolio in particular. So having the opportunity to present to you the work that I'm doing is really, really exciting. Uh, before I do go on, I have to excuse myself. I am getting a little bit over a cough, so I don't have to excuse myself. My, uh, my colleagues were, were encouraging me to do, to do like a joke where I'm feeling a little under the weather. So anyways, um, <laughs> given the topic, no pun intended. Although, yes, uh, climate is very different from weather, but anyways. Um, so before I kind of dive into what I'm here to talk about, um, I just kind of wanted to share what brings me here today. Uh, I think the summary did a great job, so thank you for that. Um, I am currently a health promoter uh, at the Niagara Region uh, Public Health, and really what I'm tackled with, uh, the ultimate question I'm trying to answer is, really how can we uh, as public health um, address uh, the question of uh, or, or what could be our response to, to uh, tackling the emerging, um, the emerging issues that come from, from climate change, particularly for, uh, towards health. Um, additionally, though, uh, the, this topic is pretty near and dear to my heart, uh, being an, uh, a camping uh, enthusiast, um, well, 
wrong button, sorry. So that's me. Um, not only, I, I kind of, uh, I wanted to share the, these pictures for, for a few reasons, not only because I wanted to showcase how great I look uh, in my camping gear, um, but also because I think these two pictures in particular really highlight um, the personal impact that I have felt uh, with uh, current climate change, um, particularly on a, on a local uh, provincial level. Um, more specifically, um, uh, this year alone, Ontario has seen a huge spike in forest fires. I'm, I'm sure all of you have heard this summer. There's actually been a 76% increase from last year to this year in terms of the amount of wildfires. Um, and I was very surprised to hear um, uh, where a lot of the, uh, the news that we have been hearing was coming from Perry Sound, which was really close to exactly the steps where I was taking the, the picture of, of Nelly Lake in Killarney. Um, so just, just bringing that on a personal level to me, um, it was also the very first year where we had to spend our entire camping trip, which we typically go off for like five or seven days, kind of in just in the wild, if you will, um, completely on a fire ban. So if there's any any camping enthusiasts out there, that can have a, a significant impact on kind of your experience. So it really did hit some of those uh, personal pieces for me, uh, especially somebody who, who is now kind of working with, with the, the climate change pieces. Um, and although it is wonderful for us to have that connection and interaction with environment. It is also easy for us to not only uh, not see uh, the local impact that we're currently uh, experiencing, but, but also how that could threaten the relationship that we do have with the environment. Um, so, so really over the next 30 or 40 minutes, depending on time, we're kind of, <laughs> I know a little bit uh, late, is um, what I'm hoping to do is provide a very, very, very brief um, out, uh, outline of the global context that we're, we're looking at w w in terms of climate change, and then dive in a little bit more detail of the local regional um, context. Um, and, and really emphasize uh, where public health uh, could play a role and has been playing a role and why it might be um, an, an important role to play in the, big, in the bigger picture of climate change. Um, I'm also going to uh, highlight some existing programs and initiatives at Niagara Region. Uh, it was great that the earlier presenter has spoken about Green Bin um, through, through waste reduction, uh, but, I'll, but I'll also uh, touch upon some other programs and services, which is really great. Um, and then I, what I will end with is really going into a little bit more detail about my current portfolio. What does that look like and what kind of work we are um, engaging in on, on, a, on a larger scale. Um, so 2018 uh, has actually been a quite interesting year for, uh, for those uh, who are interested in the topic of, of climate change, not only on a, local, on a local level, as we've been hearing over the last couple of months, uh, but also on a, on a global scale as well. Um, for those of you who didn't know, um, it, this year actually marks the 30th anniversary of um, the intergovernmental um, sorry, <laughs> panel on climate change uh, forming. Um, and even earlier this month, they have come together to uh, present uh, the, the special report on, um, on really the impact of what would happen uh, if, um, if, if we're currently, if we continue in the trend that we are where global temperatures reach um, 1.5 degrees higher to that of the pre-industrial uh, levels. Um, and really, obviously, up to this point, we have seen um, from scientific literature that we have already gone ahead and reached our one degree mark. Um, but what this report does is looks at the projections of 1.5 and really understanding the, the larger significant implications that that might have, both on a natural but the human system, so including agriculture, food access, food security, um, anywhere from ecosystem to the distribution of plants and animals, our public infrastructure, our built environment, how that's going to affect those pieces. 
uh, air, water quality, obviously the piece where I'm coming from, which is health and well-being. So, so it's really basically, you know, having an impact on some key, key systems that human life really depend on. And not to go into too much um, detail here, but really the reason I wanted to kind of highlight this image in particular is um, what really the key takeaway message from all of this and, and being in the, in the field that you are in, this should not come as a surprise, but the way we're currently functioning as a culture, a society, is just simply not sustainable. Um, so in order for us to actually have that climate resilient to foster uh, a healthy, healthy planet, we do need to undergo some, some, some serious and significant cultural shifts in the way that we are uh, doing our work and the way we are living as, as, as a society. So as if that's not enough of a complex kind of idea of thinking, um, there's the in additional layer of how all of these impacts that um, the report has highlighted it also isn't uh, proportionally um, distributed across, not only on a, on a global scale, but also very much locally as well. Um, so what we're seeing um, is that um, climate change further um, perpetuates inequities that we are experiencing um, worldwide. So I included these two, two maps in particular to really showcase the large differences between, um, between those who are um, responsible or contributing to more so to the climate change, but yet um, where the bottom one really highlights those who are more impacted uh, by, by climate change and who are um, really experiencing not only uh, much more uh, of the climate change, but much more harshly. Um, you know, it was interesting because um, when I was doing when I was doing my masters uh, in public health, I, that was probably when I I really dived into the topic of climate change at the very beginning. And I remember Professor um, this one quote that she said that has stuck to me to to these. Uh, to this day, many, many years ago, and when she said that, you know, yes, all of us are affected uh, by climate change, but it's really the most vulnerable that are actually dying from, from, from climate change. So really understanding that uh, disconnection was, was really important. Um, I also kind of wanted to um, include the, the, the image in the middle. Uh, to me, it really highlighted the, the complexity of climate change on a visual scale where it's not the same for everyone. Um, and although the, the hazard or, or the idea of climate change is very consistent, obviously, you know, if you, if you think about a storm coming and a storm hitting, however, the outcome what that implication actually looks very different. So what you see is, you know, although there's all of this rubble and all, all of this um, destruction, if you will, there's also a piece that's completely intact. And where is that coming from? And that's because it's quite more complex than just, hey, here's a hurricane. There's a lot more um, uh, complexities that include resources, vulnerabilities, and things like that. Um, so which really highlights at the end of the day is that impacts vary um, from place to place. And that's why although climate change is experienced at a global level, it is actually local action that is shown to uh, yield some of the uh, best results when it comes to uh, addressing climate change. So what does that mean on a local scale? Um, climate change in Niagara, what we are actually seeing as a whole um, is one, it's getting warmer, two, getting wetter, and three, getting much more extreme weather. Um, specifically with, with, with regards to temperatures, uh, Niagara has already seen uh, an increase of 0 0.8 degrees of, uh, of an increase that's um, in comparison to the pre-industrial eras. Um, that's pretty comparable with the global um, scale. However, if, we're, if no public effort is, is 
um, being done or if we're on the current track, it's projected to increase by 2.9 degrees by, by 2050. Um, and there's some implications in that and again thinking from, from the work that I do. So first of all, what we're, we're, we're expected to see is more hot days. So days in which um, the temperatures rise over 20 degrees. Um, quite a large increase, 62%. We're also seeing an increase in hot nights. Um, and this in particular has a, a bit of a more interesting implication in the sense that evenings and night times is usually when we uh, rely on to get some relief uh, from the hotter weather that we're experiencing during the day. So with the projections of that as decreasing, so having more of those, those hot nights, um, what we're looking at is our stress levels being even prolonged where we don't have that relief. Um, and then, uh, of course, not only is the number of heat waves are projected to increase, but also it being uh, in longer duration. Um, and really thinking about um, the health benefits of that that I will cover um, in a little bit. Additionally, we've already seen Niagara getting wetter. We've actually seen a total precipitation increase of, uh, of up to about 12%. Now, obviously, not as high of, of an increase as with the heat, which makes sense. Um, but where the implication becomes really interesting is that although precipitation is expected to increase by 66 milliliters uh, by uh, sorry millimeters by 2050 most of that increase is actually going to happen in a fewer time span so what we're going to be seeing is larger heavy rain events so most of that increase is actually happening in a span of days or hours versus weeks, months, years that we're normally used to. Um, so in thinking about flooding and thinking about the implications that's, that that can, can have. Um, and then obviously uh, trends towards conditions where we have uh, increased risk of thunderstorms, high winds, um, hailstorms, tornadoes, and things like that. So, so that's what our local context kind of looks like and where we're projected to, to go should uh, no or very little effort is being done. But where does public health kind of fit into all of this piece? Um, so, so public health, just to give you a really brief overview for those who may not be as familiar, um, public health is really concerned with addressing threats and issues that are uh, important for whole populations. So, which is a little bit different from a medical model where you may, might treat <coughs> patients or individuals, um, you're looking at holistic whole population uh, concerns. And, it, and this work is really rooted um, in the ideas of prevention, protection, uh, promotion of health, and overall improving quality of life. So there's a really a spectrum of activities in, in under this whole umbrella of public health that we could uh, engage in. Anything from surveillance, tracking, monitoring of data, all the way to policy work, to, to health promotion, and, and, and things like that. Um, climate change is actually really a, a perfect example of an issue that is affecting whole communities, whole populations, um, and the fact that it's having a direct impact on the health of communities. Um, so what is actual, what is that? really look like. Uh, well, actually, climate change has been quoted as the biggest global uh, health threat of the 21st century uh, by Lancet uh, Climate Change Commission back in 2009. Um, <clears throat> simply put, climate change has uh, both direct and indirect impacts on, uh, on health and the population. Uh, most simply put, probably the, the most direct ways through, through injuries, displacement, and premature death that you might experience from an extreme weather, uh, weather event like, like flooding or something uh, or that, we, that, that I presented earlier. Um, but to give a kind of a more recent example, just this summer alone, um, about 70 people had reportedly uh, died due to uh, heat-related um, issues from the heat wave that hit Quebec uh, back in July. Uh, so that was a really direct influence as a result of uh, a heat-specific event that we are projected to see more of. Um, 
Extreme temperature, uh, extremes in temperatures alone uh, continue to contribute to really an array of, of deadly uh, illnesses, anywhere from heat stroke to heat exhaustion to even hyperthermia as well. Um, hot temperatures in, in particular uh, have shown to be uh, to further uh, aggravate uh, things like allergies, respiratory, cardiovascular um, disease, illnesses such as um, heart attack or heat stroke. And what's interesting about heat in particular, um, it's, it's known to be one of the leading uh, weather-related um, killers of our time, but it's also one of the most preventative, um, especially with uh, some, some, some accurate and proper outreach um, and interventions that we can, that we can provide through, through public health. Um, additionally, due to these climatic larger changes, what we are seeing is increased uh, vulnerability and uh, susceptibility, sorry, to uh, skin cancer, um, as well as uh, its impact on the environment, so things like water, food, uh, quality and safety, as well as one of the things that we have been uh, looking um, really much more in-depthly in, uh, in Niagara region is uh, vector-borne diseases, so Lyme disease, West Nile, um, and due to these larger climatic changes, what we're seeing is the distribution of these, these vectors are, are getting larger and we're starting to even see new diseases that we typically, uh, that have been typically associated with hot climate uh, places. And it's actually interesting, uh, I'll just um, add this in uh, just because of the earlier presentation about red meat. Um, one of the uh, vector-borne diseases, and, and I wish I had put it in my, uh, in my notes, I don't recall the name of it, but it's, it's particular, uh, it's, it's an American tick that has been coming to this region where cases have been increasing, that its consequences is aversion to red meat. So like that's part of its disease. So it was just an interesting way of balancing um, that out. So we're, although we see more of that, so maybe that will be an intervention in its own. Um, and then, of course, a lot of uh, impacts on mental health um, as well, um, as a result from stress, anxiety, depression that can, that can come from, you know, destroyed homes or, or extreme events that might be happening. And then, of course, additionally, uh, not everybody uh, experiences climate change the same way. It is disproportionately impactful to an already vulnerable population, so, so individuals who are elderly, young children, those with chronic illnesses, um, and in general with limited resources, uh, such as income or social networks, uh, particularly at risk of climate uh, change-related implications. Um, so I included this image. What, what I really like about it is the fact that um, it, it really emphasizes the larger kind of picture of how climate change can affect health. And we've, we've talked about sort of those, those, those health out outcomes that are particularly sensitive to climate-related risk. Um, but looking at how it's not isolated, that it's, that it's quite more complex. Um, and in particular, really everything from our individual actions that we spoke in the earlier presentation, as well as the environments in which, which really reinforce some of that behaviors on a human level, how that contributes to, um, to our emission of greenhouse gases and, and the implications that that's having both on a global aspect but how that's transpiring on a local level through extreme heat alerts, uh, sorry, extreme uh, heat events, um, air pollution, droughts, wildfires, um, flooding storms, and then what impact that that's having both environmentally but, but also on a health aspect as well. And the part that you might not be able to read really well, uh, but just uh, in, in the space between environment and health outcomes, but the idea that, again, those impacts are filtered further through the social determinants of health as well as um, some of those inequities that further um, 
influence the degree to which we may or may not be vulnerable um, to, to climate change. So that really provides a holistic outline of the process in which climate change takes place on a local level. And the bottom really is, well, what are we actually going to do about it? And that's really where the intervention pieces come in. And although we typically, uh, when it comes to interventions, we typically hear mitigations versus adaptations as, as the kind of two end spectrum pieces, it's really there, there is a bit of an array of, of interventions uh, where, where it acts as a spectrum where uh, on one end you have more that are prevention focused and on the other end you have a bit more responsive pieces so now that uh, to deal with some of the consequences that are resulting from, from climate change. Um, and they're really targeted at different levels. Uh, obviously, everything from policy change um, to then responding to something like a, like a disaster. Um, it's also important to note that um, it's not so black and white as well, um, that some interventions can actually be a little bit of uh, of both of them, like for example, with green roofs, green roofs is, is is a great example of both a mitigation strategy as well as an ad adaptation strategy. Where um, yes, it's removing greenhouse gas effects, but it's also oh, sorry emissions, but it's also um, acts as a stormwater um, piece as well that kind of prevents flooding and and, and those pieces. Um, so. So although it is quite holistic, I will say that the two pieces that it is missing or doesn't quite touch upon, uh, one being uh, the directionality of it, so whether the impacts are directly felt or indirectly, um, but also the idea of co-benefits. And that particular topic is, is quite interesting to us in public health uh, for a number of reasons. Um, but it, it's, what's great about it is that um, as the name <laughs> suggests, is that it's about having positive benefits to both uh, the climate change aspect, but as well as the health uh, component as well. So, so a great example. So these are our number of examples of, of co-benefits in here. Uh, one in particular that I will be highlighting a little bit later in the slide is uh, around active transportation. So active transportation and promotion of active transportation is, is a great uh, co-benefit strategy because one, it gets uh, cars off the road, so great, great climate change piece, but it also has an array of health benefits, you know, anything from improved mental health to improved physical health, improved cardiovascular um, pieces, pieces as well, and it's focusing on these kinds of intera interventions that are having these dual benefits have been shown to have some of the best, re uh, best results uh, from, from the intervention um, side of it. So to tackle the, the, the complex um, issues of climate change, because it is quite a heavy topic, um, two years ago, um, Population and Public Health Division from the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care have come up with a framework for action. And really what this is, is to guide um, local public health units like Niagara, uh, Niagara Region, uh, as well as others, uh, to really build their capacity in being able to mitigate some of those efforts um, to address the emerging risks of climate change and really build that idea of healthy, adaptive, resilient communities. Um, and really doing that through, through a couple of um, strategies. One is, again, looking at what are the health outcomes uh, that are related to climate change. How are we reducing that piece? Uh, reducing the factors that are associated with exposure um, to climate change uh, hazards and implementing um, interventions that are not just adaptive but also proactive that are mitigating some of those uh, pieces. And it's really um, this framework that's guiding a lot of um, programs and services that are provided on a regional, on a regional level. So what are we actually doing at the region? Um, so there's actually a couple of initiatives. So looking at just 
public health in particular. Um, one of the earlier uh, programs that we had it, and, and currently ongoing is the Extreme Heat and Cold Alert program. So basically, any time um, that we're expected um, to get temperatures that are where the humidex is higher than 40 degrees for two consecutive days, or um, or days where uh, the both uh, temperatures during the day and during the night uh, ex exceed a certain amount uh, for, for, for two days, a heat alert goes out. Um, and this heat alert acts uh, as, and, and this is a similar thing that happens with cold weather. So if it's extreme cold weather, um, I believe it's below 15 degrees is when, um, uh, is, is when alert goes out and that gets issued to, uh, through different channels to the public, uh, but also working with specific agencies who might be working with vulnerable populations where they can then take local action to intervene uh, with some of those potential risks uh, and factors. Um, and, and this is, uh, again, a very responsive uh, intervention, if we're, if we're thinking about it. Uh, we're anticipating a risk and we're responding to it. Um, another program that we have is beach and private water testing and monitoring. So especially during uh, summer months, because uh, nobody's going to the beach right now, um, there's ongoing monitoring to uh, check um, the safety of water, and we also do this uh, through submissions of private water samples as well from, from uh, private wells. Um, and the idea of it is to ensure uh, the water quality um, is, is safe for the public. Um, and where this is becoming particularly impactful is during uh, events of extreme precipitation, so really heavy, uh, heavy rain flow, uh, as well as extreme heat, which are uh, both uh, impacting the water quality. Um, we're also, one of the big pieces of we're doing is vector-borne disease surveillance. So really tracking the distribution of, uh, of, of ticks uh, in the area as well as um, um, mosquitoes uh, to test for West Nile and to test for, uh, for Lyme disease and, and to really um, ensure that we have the correct uh, information to intervene at different, different areas. Uh, we also have a partnership with Brock University to do some, uh, some work and some data gathering through the Rotham uh, STAD trap, which again takes a sample of the kinds of vectors that might be in the atmosphere uh, and test them for different kinds of diseases that might be, um, uh, that might be at risk to populations. And that's how we usually hear or, or find out about some of the new diseases. Um, and then, of course, uh, the piece that I had mentioned with active transportation. So there's a lot of work that's going into working with policies around building an environment that is beneficial to active travel. Um, and and, and, and really supporting that piece as a way to get people uh, away from their cars and on their feet and obviously having those, those ben beneficial, um, those co-benefits that I had talked about. Um, and then of course, emergency preparedness, so in an event of a disaster, um, how, to, how to respond and react to that. So that's really happening on a public health level. On a regional level overall, there are some uh, some exciting things that are taking place. Um, first of all, through the Energy Conservation and Demand Management Plan, we are uh, required by the ministry to be reporting on greenhouse gas emissions. So then looking at how can we make our, our buildings more energy efficient as a mitigation strategy. Also having policies with stormwater runoffs, how are we dealing with those kinds of pieces, especially as more heavy events are being planned. Um, and then the part that's, that's uh, a bit more exciting uh, is um, we are currently in the process of doing a very large revision on the current official plan for the Niagara region. Um, so this is a really great opportunity to then look at policy development that really considers uh, work around climate change and ensuring that our policies uh, directly uh, influence um, 
what research and evidence is showing us being productive in mitigating and adapting to climate change. Um, it was, uh, the, the piece that's exciting for us is climate change. This is the first year that climate change is uh, going to ideally have its own section um, as it's going through through the revisions, which it's usually uh, been kind of clumped into the environmental uh, component. So it's really shedding a lot more awareness, a lot more education, and intentional efforts on work around uh, climate change, which is, which is exciting. Um, so in addition to all the other things that we've seen in 2018, um, the other update has been uh, is uh, through the public health standards. So public health standards have been updated this year for the first time to include climate change as a required uh, topic for public health to address um, and, and engage in, in um, more intentional work, uh, which is great. Um, and it's really looking at, uh, again, how can we build our natural and healthy environments to support uh, climate change mitigation and, and, and generally improve health. Um, now, as, as I've been saying, up to this point, a lot of the work in public health has been reactive. Um, whether that's been adaptation focused or directly in response to what we've been seeing on this level. But with this particular guideline, we're um, intending to do much more work around health promotion and climate change. And health promotion as a topic is, is, is quite interesting um, because it, it's really looking, again, at, at more of those uh, proactive preventative uh, pieces, but it's really about enabling people to increase control in order to improve their health. And from what we've learned in the earlier, uh, uh, the earlier presentation, it's powerlessness was a huge predictor to climate change behavior and how people respond um, to, to this topic in general. And really a goal of health promotion is how do we build individual capacity and population capacity so that feel that they can actually take control uh, um, um, over this, uh, over this issue, and we do that in really a number of ways. There's five in particular that I directed through the Ottawa Charter for Health Promotion, and that's looking at uh, policy development um, with supporting uh, our environments, so really ensuring that our environment complements what we're trying to get people to do. So if, if we're building neighborhoods where it's taking you you know, that much longer and that, having that, that much more obstacles to get that green bin out, um, it's going to be a lot less motivating to you for you to do that. So it's looking at really forming um, that built environment to support those pieces. It's looking at health services. It's orienting those health services to, again, complement um, uh, those pieces. Uh, personal individual skills, again, training, education, awareness, um, and community actions, ensuring that uh, at the local level that the capacity is there to address uh, some of these some of these pieces. So that's really where, where, where health promotion comes in and really the core portion of what it is that, that I do in, in, with my portfolio. Um, and what I have, and it, it is, as, as I had mentioned, it's quite new. Um, so we are still in the planning phases of it. Uh, but really what my goal is, is to increase climate resiliency for the Niagara region overall. And, and how we're doing that is really, in, especially in the planning phases, we do have four objectives that, that we are looking into, um, uh, we are looking further into. One of it being to really define what is the local public health issue or what is the current health burden that we're seeing on a local scale. So right now we're looking at uh, epidemiological data that's looking at 
well, what are um, heat related illnesses and how are they, what are the trends that we're seeing during heat, uh, uh, heat alerts, um, during storms, um, and then plotting all of that data to really outline where are the vulnerable communities are and what those vulnerabilities look like. Um, so a lot of data collection and working with our epidemiologist uh, to look through that. And to really, the goal is to highlight, again, those risks and those vulnerabilities so that when it is time to uh, put in an intervention, we are targeting individuals who are most uh, at risk. We are, through this, um, um, through this task, we'll be providing a report at the end of it, so really highlighting some of the work that we're doing. Another huge component of that work is community engagement. Um, obviously, again, as I had mentioned multiple times, it's, it's such a huge topic, and it's not a topic that um, can be done on, on a solo level. So community engagement is key. So working with stakeholders, looking at partnerships, collaborative opportunities, having the opportunity to, to check in with, with yourselves and with others about the work that's, that's being done, seeing where those opportunities for collaboration can take place. So we're very, very open to that and, and is a core component of the work that we're doing. The other piece uh, that uh, we're working on is a situational assessment. So really doing a comprehensive gap analysis in terms of what kind of policies are currently put in place and where are those missing gaps where we can actually put in, uh, put in the work and improve on. Um, and then ideally from all of that uh, conversation gathering is outline uh, the, the specific populations, the specific uh, interventions that we can then, from a health pr uh, promotion level, then um, implement for for the region, and and really, um, um, it, it's the it's the vulnerability piece that's that's really important. And just to ca um, touch up on upon that really quickly is that when we're talking about vulnerabilities, we're looking really it's a combination of three core concepts. One is the exposure. So what are the, um, the, the, the hazards that we are actually exposed to from the climate perspective, but also looking at sensitivity. Um, there's, um, like for example, children are a lot more sensitive to the impacts of heat um, than an adult just because of their um, uh, biological and physical makeup, um, as well as our ability to adapt. So having things like cooling centers, um, having things like like policies put in place to activate those those cooling centers, those are examples um, of adaptive um, um, capabilities that are then added with exposure and sensitivity to really define the vulnerable areas at the region where we can then intervene uh, from a health, um, health perspective. So all in all, just, just to uh, kind of summarize um, some of our next steps is, again, really uh, defining and describing in detail what is um, that health burden, both currently but also uh, as it's being projected. Um, understanding some of the gaps that we currently have in our work um, will really allow us to then identify uh, some of the priorities and areas that we really are able to do some of our best work in. And then <clears throat> obviously wanting to communicate some of these pieces through um, with the public as well as with our stakeholders and in what we do. Um, and again, ultimately, not one person's responsibility. Um, so really in order for us to, to, to really achieve that social uh, transformation that I, IPCC has talked about uh, that is needed, really that collective effort um, is needed and that's really what we're pushing through with, with public health. So that's it for me, um, thank you. And yeah, if there's any questions, happy to take them. Thank you very much, Veronica. Um, I know personally I don't often think about the health piece um, in terms of climate change, so I thought, and I don't know 
Um, it's the same for everyone else in the room, but it's nice to have that reminder and um, also just find it very hopeful to think that the Niagara Region Public Health is, does have certain programs in place and is thinking about um, tackling these sorts of problems. So yeah, let's uh, open the floor up to questions. Yes, okay, I think you were first. Yeah, um, so again, we, we are in the early stages. So a lot of our collaboration currently is happen happening internally. However, um, I, and when I say internally, we're looking at the different divisions within the region, uh, both, um, like for example, with the official plan is that we are currently sitting on the committee uh, as the health perspective for, um, for for the implications of climate change on health to direct some of what's going to go into the, the official plan work. Um, but that's one element. The other pieces is um, with public works and their, their, their waste management. Um, so, so really our collaboration right now is happening at, at a very internal level. However, we have a very explicit goal uh, to be working with the different municipalities. Um, so really the 12 municipalities across the region to really help define some of their policies to be including elements of climate change in the way that they are building their environment, building their communities, uh, looking at their infrastructures. So a lot of those pieces, um, just, uh, and again, looking where, where we come in from, from a public health level is we always have um, the, the perspective of population health as a motivator that we can then interject where it's, it's Yes, there's, there's a money component, there's a funding pieces, but it's also where's the benefits to, to that mitigate, climate change mitigation strategy that will then have an impact on health. who you ask um, the idea so so I mean we there's a lot of better people to talk about the connection between climate change and vector borne diseases than than myself because what what's um, they'll probably describe is the idea of warmer temperatures is that the longevity of um, uh, the ticks being able to live m more through our heart or harsh winters um, is more likely, which means that they'll they'll be spreading uh, more. It's kind of the idea around it. Um, now, it's it's an inter when it comes to communicating uh, pieces around climate change. There's you know it. it there's a lot to think about when we're tailoring our image, uh, sorry, our messages, because a part of it, um, yes, you can, it, it's looking at the larger goal of it. So from somebody from environmental health who, who does understand the, the climate change implications on the rise in Lyme disease, they, their goal might ultimately be is to, is for individuals to 
uh, reduce their exposure and things like that, and maybe less so uh, highlighting the climate change pieces, where maybe a role with health promotion, it is making those connections. So it's going to uh, policy makers, decision makers, and really being like, if this is a concern to you, one of the ways you could potentially uh, mitigate that risk is through work uh, in climate change. So it really depends um, who your audience is in terms of addressing that um, and, and, and really what your, what your goal is ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited. I haven't I haven't coughed at all, and this is this is going great. <laughs> um, it's my understanding that dealing with public health as it pertains to climate mm -hmm. cycling and short term is, is really dealing with poverty, and that I yeah. waited the whole presentation. Like it's coming. It's yeah. Coming. yeah. I, I know there's discussion of multiple yeah. populations, mm -hmm. and that's obviously where it fits. Yeah. Um, but when you can't afford to keep the air conditioner on, or you yeah. can't afford to keep the heat on, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a huge component of it. Um, what we're hoping to do is through the data collection, like the surveillance piece, um, and really being able to map out um, some of those vulnerable areas, what we're hoping and anticipating the data is going to show us exactly that. So when it comes to then putting in an intervention, we can then have evidence to suggest that, hey, if we're going to put funding into a project or an intervention, it is best for us to target populations like who don't have access to air conditioning and things like that. Um, what that ends up looking on a practical level, I wouldn't be able to answer that piece, but what it does is then put, shine a light on that exact issue. And, um, you know, as, as a region, um, like Niagara region as a whole, there's a huge component of health equity and, and thinking about those the lack of access for some folks because of things like income, um, you, you know, um, other so, uh, socioeconomic status indicators. So it's really about taking the evidence to really shine the light on exactly that issue, and that's a huge concern for public health. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A cooling center is really any facility that is public um, that can provide relief in an event of a heat. So that could be a library, that could be a community center, that could be um, lots of those kinds of things. Maybe it's even, um, you know, bringing a tent in a park and maybe adding some, some, some cooling pieces to it. Um, it those are potential um, interventions, but then it's like, you know, there's so much more to it than build it and they'll come, you know, there's, how are we actually reaching the populations that are most harmful to that? Uh, how are we engaging them? How safe and comfortable would they feel to then access, um, you know, those areas? Uh, and how do, Maybe the rest of the public feels towards that. There was a there is a lot of discussion uh, around parks in particular, where especially during a heat event, what they've been finding is that that was a a natural resource that a lot of individuals who are experiencing homelessness would go to. You know, there's large trees that was almost their their cooling station, if you will, or cooling center. But yet, a lot of other folks felt uncomfortable having, you know, an individual who, you know, maybe visibly is homeless around the children that are also playing in this park. So there's also that layer of how are we bridging those pieces and how are we addressing the stigma that's surrounding it so that we make it accessible for individuals who need it most to access that support. Yeah. So it's, it's complicated. <laughs>
example um, I can I can definitely just from from our conversations uh, we understand that the concept of resiliency um, is, is 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 broad and can and can have multiple kind of components of it um, where it is everything from what, what you had mentioned um, that's why a, a big part of our approach is uh, adding in like focusing more on the spectrum of interventions rather than one particular area. Because up to this point, we've been hearing a lot of like, are you going to go the mitigation route? Are you going to go the adaptation route? Where it's really about where, how can we um, put effort into all the different areas so that it's a holistic approach um, that will then contribute to, to, to resiliency. Even from some of the, the conversations and, and talks that I have been to or listened to, is one piece around building resiliency was, you know, just improving the health. So even having the capacity to address, um, like physically and mentally, the potential of something that you know you, you that may or may not happen is already a huge indicator of resiliency. So. So um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a concept that we're we thinking about. We might not have an answer for you at the moment, but it's definitely, uh, we understand kind of um, the different, how, how co complex and holistic that could be. Yeah. Okay, if we don't have any other questions, um, just on behalf of myself, the SRC and everyone else who attended today, uh, I just want to say thank you to both Veronica and Gary. Um, so if we could have one more round of applause for both of our guests today.